So um, I, I have a, a, a number of things I want to say. I think the most important uh, message is congratulations for getting the Exceed Award uh, done. And I think I heard it's already been officially announced today, right? So I can, can formally talk about it. And uh, most of my talk, some of you will have seen some of it. The first half of it is derived from things that I've been talking about for the last couple of years. But the second part of it is specifically about just ideas uh, about how Exceed can become a centerpiece for this vision. And so I have a couple of suggestions for you all on how you might do that in working with the community and also working with NSF, uh, and in particular with, with NSF program directors. That I'll, I'll, so I'll come to that in a few minutes. So, so anyway, the, the theme of my talk is how science and engineering and, and actually society in many ways are on a very accelerating path towards some future that really clearly involves data and computation in a very fundamental way. And so the first part of my talk is about how times are changing, uh, not so much uh, about the science, although I, as you know, those of you who know me um, know that I can help talking a little bit about black hole collisions as a motivator for everything uh, in the world, so I will use that. Um, but it's mostly about the cultures and methodologies of science and how they're changing so rapidly. Okay, so um, I like to, I thought this was very powerful when I first started thinking about the, the history of science and how, in effect, the, the punchline here is that we've got about four centuries of, of data-driven and uh, compute-driven science, uh, but only in the last couple of decades have things really begun to change. And so there's almost a step function in the way uh, the, the culture of science and, and the methodologies are changing. So if you go back a few centuries, back to the time of Galileo and Newton, you find that you had very brilliant individuals working with uh, perhaps a student uh, revolutionizing our view of the universe, but doing it um, in a way that was fairly slow in terms of the pace of change. Although there were revolutions, um, the, the, uh, the time it takes for things to really change is measured in terms of actually decades and even centuries, and now it's measured in literally days. And, and so the, the, the pace of change has really uh, increased dramatically. But also um, the culture of doing science. So I particularly want to point out how uh, Galileo was very important in particular in thinking through um, the fact that science needed to be driven by experiments and by data, and it needed to be reproducible. And those are two themes that I think we're actually coming back at, at almost in crisis levels right now. The ability to reproduce our science and our research, given the very complicated cyber infrastructure environments and the, the large collaborations that are often developing, is becoming uh, uh, of paramount importance, let's say. Uh, and also, um, the, uh, the, the culture of doing science is changing because collaborations are expanding uh, a lot in order to allow us to look at the kinds of problems that are important in the 21st century. So anyway, Newton and Galileo began this, uh, and I would say if you were to digitize the kind of work that they were doing in terms of taking data, putting it in notebooks, and so on, you'd see that they were generating something like kilobytes of data. If you were to see how many um, arithmetic computations per second somebody like Newton could do, even if he was very good and, and had a lot of coffee, he couldn't do more than about one floating point operation sustained per second, I would say, over, over some period of time, but not, not for very long even. So, and the style of collaboration was about one scientist with perhaps one student. And then, of course, there was no email, so things were actually developed through letters and so on. And, and actually, the progress and the propagation of scientific results was actually very slow. I mean, literally carried on a horseback or on boat. So now, fast forward about literally 400 years. And so I'd like to start in, in my fast forward up to about 1972. I am advancing my slides. We are still on your title slide. That is, okay. Ah, there you go. Okay, they're advanced here. So, okay, the pace of change on that slide is slower than the pace of change on my laptop. <laughs> All right, I don't know why. Well, it's a relativistic effect. John, John will know. It's a, the lapse function is, is very um, high near me. So anyway, <laughs> um, so, Around 1972, Stephen Hawking, carrying on this tradition, uh, building on work of people like Galileo and, and Newton, and then finally Einstein, um, was able to work out what happened when two black holes collided in a theoretical sense. And he did a, a scientific visualization, which you can see here on the left-hand side of your screen is a, a hand-drawn sketch. But nonetheless, um, if you were to digitize that, it's perhaps 50 kilobytes. And again, the, the style of doing work was one brilliant scientist, perhaps with a student or two. So the point is that the culture of doing science hadn't really changed in all of these centuries. But now, in the last few decades, and I use work coming out of 
groups that I've been involved in in collaborations, in particular with Washington University, Waimo Suen's group in, at, at WashU in, um, in St. Louis, um, about 10 year, 20 years after Hawking carried out that sort of theoretical calculation, we did a supercomputer calculation on something like a Cray YMP or a Cray 2, probably did it on both, I can't remember. By the way, I, I read an article recently where Jack Dungara had done a, a calculation of the uh, capability of the iPad 2, and it was roughly something like a four processor Cray at the time, so <laughs> that's another indication of the rate of change. But anyway, if you take a look at that diagram, you can see we've worked out in great detail, and I would call this an honest calculation in the sense that we really solved Einstein's equations in great detail in axisymmetry to look at what, what happened when two black holes collided. And if you look at the a number of people that were needed to carry out that calculation, we had people doing scientific visualization, we had parallelization to worry about, we had new algorithms, we had people to, to figure out where's the event horizon in the black hole. These are all very complicated individual pieces that have to be integrated in order to carry out this calculation. If you look at the amount of data, it's something like a thousand times more than was done about 20 years before. So that's a pretty big increase. But now look at the right-hand side of the screen. Going to full three dimensions, it turns out that you have more variables to worry about. You need more processors. So there's a full three-dimensional calculation of the waves coming from two black holes colliding that required um, something like a 256 processor Origin 2000, a larger group. And the amount of data that's coming out is now about 50 gigabytes. And so that's a thousand times more than the axisymmetric calculation from just a few years before. So you see the trend. We have very small uh, gaps in time that lead to very large changes in the amount of data, the computation, the amount of knowledge needed in order to carry out some kind of work. So this has culminated in the last few years in a, in a breakthrough in uh, relativity that was a community effort coming from a lot of different uh, contributions and also leading to the development of toolkits where people were able to work together to share software, to share their knowledge, and so on. And one example, this is a, a project that some of you I know are in the audience here are engaged in, um, uh, involving a collaboration across the US, and in fact across the world, with something like 55 consortium members, at least as of the time of this slide about a year ago. And I know Gabrielle Allen talked about this uh, at last year's TerraGrid meeting. But the, the main point I want to make is that these toolkits and these collaborations are allowing much more sophisticated calculations to be carried out. And I think I'll skip the, the movie of the black holes because you've already seen it. But basically, it's two black holes going around. You've probably seen those 100 times by now with gravitational waves coming out. But the main point I want to make is that because of the collaborative structure and the sharing of software and the sharing of knowledge through these collaborations, particularly in this case embodied in the sharing of software, we've been able to really have a major breakthrough in the solution of Einstein's equations. Now, that's a really a landmark problem. It is uh, perhaps the, the most complicated set of partial differential equations in all of mathematical physics. And they're now able to be solved due to advances in the understanding of the theory, understanding of the numerical algorithms, the computational mathematics, the way to implement this on a supercomputer, and so on. So I, I would consider that a major triumph for computational science. Now, in the last year, there's been a new um, calculation that's been carried out by a, a slightly different group, but using the same toolkit. There's a, our, there are overlapping members where actually new results on the origin of gamma ray bursts, short gamma ray bursts, have been um, figured out by doing simulations of neutron stars. Now, adding, um, make, going from black holes to neutron stars is a really major change because you now have to add in hydrodynamics, magnetic fields, complicated uh, equations of state. And these are, again, uh, bits of knowledge or large bodies of knowledge that are usually embodied in completely distinct communities that don't necessarily uh, meet together, nor can they really work together effectively because they're so far uh, d uh, uh, separated, either geographically or even intellectually. They're just different communities. And yet this had to be integrated. And so this is a, a calculation that was promoted a lot, particularly by NASA, as a breakthrough carried out in particular by Luciano Rizzola uh, and collaborators uh, not only in Germany but also uh, around the world, where uh, binary neutron star coalescence is shown to be a good model for a short gamma ray burst, and in fact, even with the development of jets that are developing because of magnetic fields have been added and so on. So this is a really important calculation, but again, it wouldn't be possible without this sort of sharing of, of uh, knowledge through software uh, toolkits. OK, so that's the kind of prelude for what I'm going to tell you about what's coming in the future. And it actually goes along the same path. But I think the slope of the, the rate of change is now is going to be even more dramatic. Because with this kind of a breakthrough, 
we can now begin to look at all kinds of problems in relativistic astrophysics, whether it's black holes or neutron stars or uh, st stellar collapse and supernova explosions or uh, even strange things, quark stars, soliton stars, you name it. There's all kinds of strange stuff out there in the universe. And we have the tools at our disposal now in order to attack basically all of them and the knowledge of how to do it, but we have to integrate that from different communities. And so now you have to begin to think about radiation transport, adding in neutrinos and so on. And that's, that's complicated. It involves, therefore, a globally distributed collaboration. Now, these collaborations tend to be large enough that uh, you can't actually meet in one group and, and have a group meeting and figure out how to do this. So you have to find ways to allow the sharing of knowledge between these different communities so that any sort of subgroup of this could sort of assemble and collect the knowledge needed and then be able to, to carry out some kind of a research activity. If you look at the computing problem, you can easily calculate knowing the equations, how many arithmetic operations are needed and so on. So this is clearly at the petabyte, petascale class. And we, we once did a calculation that showed even if we downsampled everything dramatically so that you know, the bare minimum, we would want to have output of, of many petabytes of data. So we're really limited by what's available and what's convenient in order to be able to, to do the kinds of calculations like that. So this is what's got coming in the next few years in this particular field. So the bottom line here is that gravity, which has had this four century history of being rather isolated, very mathematical and so on, has suddenly exploded into a compute and data driven science. And it's not only um, in the theoretical side, but as I'll come to in just a moment, also on the experimental side. So in fact, there's a, a picture there in the upper right hand corner of the LIGO experiment, which uh, actually NSF has spent uh, close to $800 million on in the last um, 10 or 15 years in order to build detectors that will be capable of detecting gravitational waves from things like black holes colliding. Now, they've never been detected yet, but we know through these calculations of Einstein's equations and so on, we know what the waveform should look like, and we know what the strength should be, and we know roughly the kinds of sources that are out there, and therefore, we are, and we also know what the sensitivity that is, de is designed for this detector will be, and therefore, we estimate that we should be able to see dozens of events per year when the advanced LIGO detector is actually operating in about three years from now. So, so it's going to be a very exciting time. Now, that collaboration is kind of like high energy physics in the way it operates. So there are over 800 members of a collaboration that have agreed to share data uh, and then to analyze it, because this is a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. Finding these gravitational waves, are, they're so weak, they'll be very difficult to, to find the signal in the noise. And so therefore, um, there's a lot of emphasis on reproducibility and actually sharing of data so that others can take a look at it and check and see if the, the analysis is correct and so on. So I'll, I'll come to this. But, um, but the, the main point I want to end up with on this slide is that after four centuries of small science and sort of a small data culture, every few years now we're seeing not only doubling paths, but in fact factors, factors of tens to hundreds to even thousands in terms of increase in the data sizes and the, the compute needs that are coming out. Okay, so now let me look forward connecting more to the observational side in astronomy, which is really going to be one of the drivers for data intensive science going forward. So it will really be a new era where we'll be able to observe events in the universe really as they occur in real time. So we're talking about transient and data intensive astronomy. Transient meaning we will see events that will occur and then we, we may be able to actually, in real time, do some calculations, observe, and maybe even predict how those transients might evolve over a period of days or hours afterwards if you were to combine multiple kinds of observations and, and, uh, and theoretical calculations. So let me give you an example of what's being deployed there. So first of all, we have radio telescopes that are being deployed uh, at, at, at new levels. So for example, the, the one in the, at South America, the picture that just showed up there is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which is a roughly uh, over a billion dollar assemblage of uh, radio antennas, about 60 of them in the Atacama Desert, that are operated by an international consortium involving uh, particularly North America, Europe, and Asia. And so the NSF has about one third stake in that. So that's clearly a very large project with, uh, with a large data volume, and it's actually up on top of a mountain uh, in fact, it's in, a, it's in a beautiful area at about 16,000 feet up right now in the middle of uh, a, a ch the Chilean desert, one of the driest deserts in the world. And so therefore, it's rather isolated. And therefore, we have to think a lot about how to take that data and get it distributed out to this collaborations across the planet. So that's, but that's just one example. The next one I want to show you is even more remote. It's, if you look at the bottom, uh, you see a picture of the ice cube experiment, which is at the South Pole. 
So Ice Cube is a neutrino detector, and it turns out there's like 10,000 feet. You think there's a lot of snow in Utah, 500 inches per year. There's 10,000 feet of snow at the South Pole, and it never melts. I, I was there and that in the summertime. The highest temperature that, that time of the year is about 38 degrees below zero centigrade. And so it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough environment to do science, and it's also a tough environment to collect the kind of data that comes out of this uh, experiment, which is a cubic kilometer of ice that has been instrumented with electro, electric uh, digital optical modules that when a neutrino from, say, a, ga a gamma ray burst comes across the universe, goes through the Earth, and ends up coming through the Earth and then landing in the, the uh, Antarctic ice, it may emit a flash of radiation that can then be detected. And by looking at how the radiation develops, we can then figure out, ah, oh, neutrinos were coming from that particular direction. So we'd like to know, for example, if there's a gamma ray burst that might be observed in the radio, did we see something in neutrinos? And of course, these are instruments that are distributed across the planet in very inconvenient places. We also have a new array of telescopes coming, so optical telescopes, in fact, 30-meter telescopes. These are massive telescopes, at least a billion dollars each, uh, that are being proposed around the world, always now in international consortia. So these are completely digital. Um, then we have, of course, the LIGO experiment that I was telling you about that will be coming into the actual observing phase probably within the next five to ten years. So probably we expect to see some events within a few years, and then we get into the observing phase uh, where we're really seeing them routinely uh, a few years after that. So this is, we're talking about late into the next decade when these kind of things might be operating together. Now it's a completely different kind of experiment with, again, there's an array of these around the world. In fact, there's a possibility we might move one of our detectors uh, uh, one of the advanced detectors that we're deploying in the, in the U.S. to either Australia or India or some other place because it will enhance the scientific capabilities a lot if you can have them, sort of an array of them. I won't go into the details of that. But I want to just come to this last one, which is called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. So this is a planned project that's currently under review by NSF and, and by um, uh, international and private partners. And so this is a, an amazing telescope. And it, it illustrates how astronomy is changing to a completely data-intensive science. Um, and so the, the, the analogy I want to tell you about is um, every single picture that this thing takes uh, is about three gigapixels. And so some of you have got probably five or maybe 10 megapixel cameras. It's got a thousand times more resolution. So if you were to compare that in terms of high-definition television screens, you need 1,500 of them to display a single image. And it takes one of these images every 15 seconds all night long. So it takes a picture here, it takes a picture there, it just sort of scans the sky and then it starts, you know, starts, it takes over three days, it can do the whole sky, which is half the universe because you can only see the southern sky from the, from the southern hemisphere. So the point is, it will generate so much data. In fact, by comparison, some of you probably heard of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. That's the most advanced survey uh, project in astronomy that over the last decade, generated about 40 terabytes of data. So that was considered to be a lot. This will generate that much data for the whole Sloan Sky Survey every single night. And that's going to be on a mountaintop in Chile. So we have to think about how to get that data, how to distribute it, how to analyze it. And it also means we have to think about what are the new algorithms for analyzing that kind of data. They're expecting to be able to detect a million transient events every night. So there's no way that we have probably a couple thousand astronomers who <laughs> could possibly look at that. So there's just no way. So we can do citizen science. We can actually have every first grade class in the world taking a you know, small piece of their sky and taking a look at it and watching for something. But we're going to have to develop all kinds of new statistical methods, uh, uh, machine learning techniques to find features there, to find out what changed from night to night, et cetera. So this is going to be a really exciting project that has a lot of research. And it's sort of a driver for data intensive astronomy. Now, there's something that's even beyond that, a thing called the Square Kilometer Array, uh, which is a, a, a much more ambitious radio telescope that's being developed by an international consortium. Uh, and probably, if, if it could be built and the funding could be identified and so on, we're talking about 10 or 15 years before it would actually be, come to fruition. But it would be generating, uh, I don't know how much data. People give different estimates, but it's certainly exabytes. The question is, is it exabytes per month or per day? Or you know, I think it's going to be limited by the technology that's available at the time in order to really absorb the kind of data that this thing could generate. Now, a lot of people 
like me and a number of you in the room are people who would like to actually do theoretical calculations to match with these. And so you have here a picture of a, uh, a core collapse calculation carried out again by that collaboration, in this particular case led by Christian Ott at Caltech, to do um, uh, uh, theoretical calculations of things that might be observed. Now, what I'm trying to get to is that in order to observe any one of these kind of events, like a gamma ray burst, we may actually, and really understand it, we may actually have to integrate activities from all of these different kinds of telescopes, detectors, neutrinos, optical, radio, and th theoretical calculations somehow and have the capacity to do this almost in real time, because these are transient events that may take, uh, make, take shape over a few days, and you really like to catch them kind of as they're happening, and then really do some calculations, understand how they might de develop, and so on, in order, for example, to tune your detectors or to know what to look for as it develops. And this requires a very advanced cyber infrastructure that also re requires the integration across disciplines, end-to-end -end connectivity, and that's why I was showing this in a map of the, uh, the uh, global optical network um, uh, uh, initiatives that are being carried out around the world, and so uh, this is going to also drive a lot of optical networking technologies as well. It also means that these communities have got to be able to share data and software and knowledge and potentially in real time. So I focused a lot on astronomy because I think it's going to be one of the drivers for data intensive science, but it's not the only one. In fact, we see this, this is the thing that's really been stunning to me within NSF in the last couple of years to see every single discipline, every single one really focused on the data intensive side. Uh, now, so I, I just, this is a sort of a supercomputing community to some degree. The supercomputing aspects are still important, and data intensive, of course, is still compute intensive as well. So I'm not forgetting about the sort of traditional computational science side, but I just see a lot more on the data side that's kind of coming out in every one of the disciplines. So, so here's just another example, and many of you have seen me talk about this before, Hurricane Katrina being modeled. In fact, some of you here have been involved in this particular uh, visualization and, and some of the simulations, but at every black dot is the actual location of Hurricane Katrina, and at every uh, sort of colored line that comes out is a model of where the atmospheric development will go in time. And so you see at five days out, which is what we're at right here, we didn't have much of a good idea, but at three days out, all of the uh, models had more or less converged that it would hit New Orleans. However, in order to really get this right, we have to then couple information from satellites that get injected into the models that initialize them, information from centers across the Gulf of Mexico, carrying out measurements of things like wind speed, wave height, uh, temperature, and so on. All of that's important to initialize the models and then to compare to see which of those models are actually following the actual trajectory. So you want to be able to compare that. So you have a lot of resource scheduling to worry about. How do you farm out all those models? But it gets even more complicated. The thing you really care about if you're living on the coastline here is the wind is one thing, but the storm surge where all the water comes is much more devastating. And so that's actually what, what ends up uh, ca causing the most tragic loss of life is the storm surge. You have a 20 foot storm surge, or in this case, a 27 foot storm surge, a, a wall of water being driven by 180 mile per hour winds. That's very, very damaging. And uh, so that the, t in order to model that, you have a completely different set of communities that model that for, um, for different regions. In fact, they're different models for whether it's the Florida Pan Panhandle or the New Orleans area or the Texas Panhandle and so on. So you have to then dynamically couple different kinds of models and then you have to think about how will the levees hold up? You could model that. That brings in civil engineers. Where should you put supplies? Um, how about communications? What about traffic patterns? How will people respond? So you have this complete sweep from the social behavioral economic scientists through engineering, through uh, hydrodynamic modelers and so on, through groups doing scheduling on grids and supercomputing and uh, coupling and uh, validation and verification. All of this has to be integrated in a period of five days. So we're not talking about, you hope to do this in 10 years. This is real time. It's really emergency. There's life at stake. And it's, and it's, so we need to be thinking about developing cyber infrastructure as well as uh, software engineering ability to mix and match components as well as um, data sharing policies and so on that really enable these kinds of scenarios. Now I think Exceed 
is probably the first time that there's a national architecture that has the capability of actually putting some sort of sanity into the, in all of this because there, you have an architecture that you're planning and you will have the ability to make services compatible with, with each other, have communities working together through the cyber infrastructure that allows them to share things. So this illustrates to me what we're calling grand challenge communities, where there are complex problems and they're in every area. I've got scenarios in biology and so on. So there are a few listed here that are kind of driven by the, um, the emergency response kind of scenario or the time dependent thing with, in astronomy. But, but there are many scenarios where even if there's not time critical, that you need to be able to integrate knowledge from different groups. And I think when some people, are concerned when they hear me talking about this that I, I've forgotten about individual scholarship. This is all a number of individuals that still will be getting NSF grants that support the individual investigator. This is still the bread and butter, but we're thinking more about how we can actually integrate these activities and it, in sort of a multi-scale way. So we have individuals that may sort of coalesce as groups to look at certain kinds of problems. The groups may coalesce to look at Bigger, bigger challenges that a group can't do, all the way up to having different communities that need to be able to share knowledge in different ways. And I think, I'm, my hope is that Exceed will begin to allow us to have the architecture that can begin to integrate these different kinds of activities. So the fundamental point I want to make here then towards the bottom of the slide is that people in these environments and these communities fundamentally share uh, and collaborate by sharing data. That's the only way they can really do it. It's not that they're going to f have a single group meeting to address this particular problem. And so it's making us think a lot at NSF about how do we have access all the way to in into individual desktops? What is a publication? A publication is somehow a result, a scientific result that is now going to be disseminated to the community. It's increasingly going to be digital and it's going to be also data. It may be software and we're thinking about ways to sort of encourage the publication of more modern forms of, uh, of scientific output. So not just digitizing your FizRev letter but actually the data, the software and so on that were associated with that, that's coming. All right, so people are then are beginning, therefore, to experiment with social networking technologies. Uh, and so a couple of examples coming out of the LSU group here, uh, using things like Twitter to have your simulation code actually send out status reports to say it's up to time step, whatever, the two black holes have collided, the code has unfortunately crashed, you know, you'd like to know, and your collaborators would like to be able to, uh, to work together and to, to monitor this as if it were a real experiment. So this is a, one way of, of communicating with people. Another one is to use things like Flickr to communicate your scientific visualizations as they're being done. So most people use this to put their kids' pictures up. You can put your, um, your most precious um, black hole simulations up on Flickr and share them this way. So this indicates to us at NSF, and we talk a lot now, really a lot, with the social, behavioral, and economic sciences about how are people going to collaborate in these environments? And what are the issues? And so it's, a, it's as much of a social issue as it is a cyber infrastructure issue. As you know, working in, in this environment, uh, bringing together uh, these teams to, to pull together Exceed, I think there's a lot of social um, discussions that had to go on there as well as cyber infrastructure ones, I know. All right. So. Um, the next thing I want to say is that there's, therefore, this is a new world. There are new ideas that are coming in terms of metadata for Grand Challenge Community. So the question is, how can we better organize, communicate, and share uh, in this environment? So the problems that we have are, for example, most of the content that's out there is usually read-only. You, you have something uh, in th that you want to look at on a web page. You can't go in there and change it usually, OK? And then if you wanted to allow people to interact, usually you have to think in advance. How would, you know, what's the schema for this? What are the slots into which you could put information and so on? And you can't ever get it right because it's too complicated. Things are changing too fast and so on. So a better way to do this could be to make the world writable so that you can sort of have any object that can be tagged and then you can have people people freely write about it as you do in a wiki. So this idea of kind of merging a database with a wiki. And so um, an example that I've become familiar with in the last year or so is a thing called Fluid Info, which is an openly writable shared data store where you can have an object, anything can be declared an object, and anyone can tag it in, in any way, so as if you put post-it notes on a refrigerator. And the tags can be protected by permission. So you can make something that's that's only writable by you, or you can have others add things to it, and so on. But then it's also a database. So 
So anyway, the, the point is it's flawed in order to try to think in advance of everything that might be needed. So make this sort of flexible and open. And so this is just an experiment um, in, in regards to this Einstein toolkit that I was talking about earlier where developers can tag their routines, or in the cactus language, we call them thorns, in fluid info. And then the consortium members can go in and tag them as they like. Uh, and then it's a trusted uh, um, uh, activity because this domain is reserved for the domain owner and so on. So there, there are ways you can make this so that you have some control over it, but also allow the freedom that's needed. So you can imagine students can come in and tag things. This was useful for me here. This was used uh, for a particular publication. You get much more information that uh, that you need in order to share things. And so imagine doing this not only for software environments, but for data sets, publications, and so on to support communities. So I just point out that there was a poster by another E. Seidel who's in the audience here. Some of you might have seen him. <laughs> so, um, so there are scenarios like this in every area of science. And so I, I just, you hear often about the Large Hadron Collider as sort of the the leading force and the tip of the spear in all of these areas, but now it's coming up everywhere. So I've shown you a lot of uh, examples in uh, geosciences and astronomy. Uh, there, you might have seen a couple of weeks ago, there's a dear colleague letter to develop a thing called the Earth Cube, which is Tim Colleen as the uh, head of the geoscientist directorate at NSF and Alan Blatecki, now head of OCI, are working together to prototype what would be the right kind of data infrastructure at a national level for the geosciences. So what we'd like to do is have a number of these activities where we begin to prototype a, a national data infrastructure for the geosciences or for astronomy or for biosciences and so on, and then run some kind of conceptual design experiments and so on, prototype, and then pull back and look and see what's, what do we find in common, and then figure out how do we build all of this out. But of course, it would make no sense to do this without really leveraging the activities that you're beginning to put together as a national architecture with Exceed. So, oh yeah, I, one, the one thing I, I wanted to say that I, I forgot to mention here was just the, um, uh, the biology uh, example. So, um, the, uh, you have, in effect, a large hadron collider now potentially in everyone's, um, every biologist's lab if they're doing DNA sequencing. So these things can now generate theoretically a terabyte of data every minute. So that, if you add that up, of course, a lot of it's thrown away and it's not really kept, but that's the, that's the theoretical capacity of these things just in this year. And there was an article today in the New York Times about how fast this is moving. So it will be much higher rates very soon. And so we'll be able, able to DNA sequence basically everything, you know, entire families, thousands of organisms and so on. That's being done on a routine basis now, not just the human genome, but everything. So this is happening, and so we have to figure out then how in order to deal with this, because these are on people's campuses. It's not like one of these. They're like everywhere across the country. So then just to kind of summarize everything I've set up to now, um, it's modern science, data and compute intensive, and so on, all of this uh, change after four centuries of not much changing. So there's a, basically a step function in the way things are evolving here. And so you see all of these reports on data, 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 um, in fact, the end of science was proclaimed by Wired Magazine a few years ago because they're saying science is just, as we know it, will no longer be the same. Uh, a slightly less alarming way of putting it, the fourth paradigm, uh, the book uh, that's been edited by Tony Hay and others uh, from Microsoft, uh, from going back to Jim Gray, um, this is clearly a new wave of doing science. Now, this isn't a really important point. I think we still think along the lines that we've been brought up. So, you know, people my age, hate to say something like that, sound like I'm so old, but, but people who are my age were, were basically brought up in this old school of thinking, and now things are changing so dramatically. So we can't really have such radical change dealt with by incremental um, approaches. And so that's what I think Exceed is trying to do. And I'm going to suggest a few things in a few minutes that I, I hope will be uh, helpful for you to think through how you might integrate these kind of approaches. So students take note. I like to point this out as a pep talk to students. Your professors. Um, did what they could do, you are the next generation, and you are 10 to the 9 times more powerful than your student, than your professors are, were at your age. So with all of this excitement and change and so on, it brings a lot of crises. And uh, I'll just say we have a, a, a kind of a cyber crisis, not just a financial crisis. Uh, and we're not really on top of it, but we're getting handles on it. 
We have them in all of these areas. There's the whole multi-core issue. Well, how can you program a machine that can run on a million, I mean, a code that can run on a million processor machine or a million cores? We're approaching that now. What's the fault tolerance of this and so on? How do we deal with the data? I'll still come back to that in a minute. Software, that's one of the biggest challenges. I've alluded to that many times. How do we develop software as a community? How do we make it reliable? Software codes have millions of lines these days. Probably a lot of errors in those things. In fact, I just found a I heard of a bug in something that I've been working on for years. It was just discovered um, like last week <laughs> in Pug. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, incredibly, that was developed in the 90s and it's been used uh, by many people. Um, so a little error turned out not to be very significant. But the point is, there are lots of errors that are still in our codes. How do we develop them? How do we make sure things are reliable? Networks end to end, what do we do about that? So we have all of these things. So let me um, just cut to the chase on data again. Uh, this is actually nice to be here in Utah to, to show Chris Johnson's uh, slide. Um, as you know, uh, we've reached this point uh, that I've just circled there in red, where we're generating more unique data every single year than we have in all of the history of humanity combined. So it's every year we generate more, year, more data, not just than we did last year, but than all years combined. And so that's really extraordinary. And it means we can't really save all the data. And we really are in a new era that we have to really think very hard about. So a lot of people are thinking very hard about that. There are reports everywhere. So I, I want to come now to, um, to Exceed and, and, and NSF and what I think um, we might be able to do with this. So, I've had this slide for a while. That's sort of my attempt to draw the national cyber infrastructure. Um, and it's very messy. And it's purposely done in a very messy way, because I think it's a very messy system. And so we have in, within this, we have supercomputers. Those are the track two bubbles there. So those are roughly $30 million at a pop. We have a very large supercomputer proposed at, at University of Illinois. Um, and that's a $200 million uh, investment. So those are very large compute engines that will be needed to carry out all of this kind of um, uh, science that I've been talking about. We also have an increasing awareness that we need data. We need to create a national data infrastructure of some kind. We have software. We have the need to have networks. Those are the red lines that connect everything. We have people on campuses. That's where all the action really is. That's where the scientists are, the students are. So we have to think about them as being integral to this entire ecosystem that we're developing and so on. And on, on every one of those campuses now, you've got these bio uh, monsters generating all this data. How do we share that? How do we make it available with networks and, and policy and so on? And then we have all of these large things. And in the NSF speak, that's called an MREFC, a, a major research instrumentation um, uh, that these typically cost at least $100 million. And they're, they're all becoming large data generators. In fact, Larry Smarr recently had another colorful saying for this, said these things are more silicon than steel because they are largely investments in cyber infrastructure, of course, with the instruments being in integrated with the cyber part of it. And then we have a student. So students today see this is their world. It's not just a supercomputer or an experiment, but they're looking at these very complex challenges. And so we have to think about how do we educate people to take advantage of the instruments that they have at their disposal, and this is what they have. So it's really different. So just a side note, I won't focus on this much, but in this environment, I do think science is becoming more and more un unreproducible or difficult to reproduce. So how do we validate it? What happens when data and code and software are shared, moved around, changed? Can we really track all of that? Could we exactly reproduce the results of something that we've had before, or at least uh, in a way that could be compared in, in the right way? It's not so clear to me these days. So that's leading to a lot of discussion on what do we do when we publish a paper? How do we provide all the supporting materials so that it's clearly going to be a, a reproducible result? So there are lots of recommendations on how to deal with these crises. And I, I won't go into these details, but I, I want to remind you or thank you. Most of you contributed to these. We had a lot of reports uh, from the Advisory Committee on Cyber Infrastructure. Uh, to me, the top level um, recommendation was that a permanent programmatic activities in computational and data-enabled science, uh, CDS and E, need to be carried out, funded by the NSF, and also supported at universities. It's not an easy task. It's an easy thing to say. It's important. But how do you do it correctly? We're still thinking through very, uh, very hard. But we're working on this. So I just would urge you, if you haven't, to read these reports, because they'll be very helpful going forward as we think through many recommendations in there. What do we actually go ahead and build out now? So here are a couple of the reports. In fact, um, 
The first one says, uh, I, I've just got a couple of the key highlights um, um, marked here in red. So first it says, NSF, this is the report on campus bridging and that was led by Craig Stewart. Um, successful campus CI implementation should be studied in order to document, disseminate best practices, uh, and also financial models and deployment. So this is something that campuses are going to have to invest in. And I know it's hard, uh, but there's just not enough money at the federal level. I know there's not enough money at the state and the university level, but this is clearly going to be important to carry out our science. At the same time, um, so NSF needs to do that as well as campuses is basically what it says. And then we need to iterate as we go back and forth. So there's a lot of work to do. There's a very detailed report with recommendations there. And I, I recommend you look at that. Okay, the next one is just uh, from David Keyes on software. It says that we need to develop a multi-level long-term program to support scientific software. And I hope you've been paying attention. We do have a program um, led in particular uh, by early on by people like Abani Patra, Ma now Manish, and, and Gab Gab Manish Parashar and Gabriel Allen and others. Uh, it's an NSF-wide activity to really put software at, on first class status equal with uh, computation and facilities because I think software is really the, the modern language of science these days. Uh, mathematics is, is too, but software is even in a broader sense, I think. And so it's very important that we do this. So we're trying to listen and trying to develop this out. Um, the data task force uh, with Shenda Baker and Tony Hay, Dan Atkins and others, uh, it basically says two things at the top level. We need to develop a national cyber infrastructure and we need to think about cultural change to allow people to share data. And we are, you'll see signs of this, you've already seen probably very annoying, annoyed at us at NSF for requiring a data management plan for every single proposal. Uh, and we didn't give a lot of very specific guidance of what it should say. And that's because we think there's so much variability in the community, we wanted to make people think about it, think about what it means for their own science and community, and then have that reviewed. And we will collect data on this and we will adjust policy and make it more crystal clear as we go forward. But the point is we're working on this and you'll see other changes coming forward. For example, we are thinking about making it possible so when you submit an NSF proposal, you don't just submit your five most important publications. We're going to say five most important products that it could include publications, data, or software, and, and other such things. So we're generalizing the idea of what you should get intellectual credit for, and this should send a signal to your home universities as well. All right, so actions. So NSF has the FY12 budget request, um, which is sort of caught in limbo right now. But I just wanted to point out that we have two NSF-wide activities that are being promoted. One is uh, called C's for uh, Science, Engineering, and Education for Sustainability. It's about a billion dollars at the foundation that's being devoted to this, built on core programs. And then CIF21, which I'll just say a couple words about. Um, it's cyber infrastructure framework for 21st century science and engineering. It's money that is outside of the realm of what Exceed is, but it's really money that goes into every directorate. So every single activity or every single unit at NSF participates in this. And we are thinking of that as sort of glue money to be able to integrate different kinds of activities. So um, I just want to point out one of the examples that's related to CIF 21 is a program called CI Tracks, where we're trying to actually support in a much more fundamental way the careers of young scientists doing computational and data-enabled science. And I wanted to uh, make sure that everybody's aware of this. It's a postdoc program for people in any discipline that's computational or data intensive, could be developing uh, a, a data services or new algorithms related to this in sense of something that could be useful and deployable uh, in terms of cyber infrastructure, or it could be on the science side, someone carrying out supernovae simulations, but very intently on the, the cyber infrastructure and, and algorithmic side and so on. So, and if you were to get an assistant professorship, if you have one of these postdocs, you can convert it to startup funds in a second stage review process that would allow you to do that to make you uh, sort of more uh, off to a better start, let's say, when you begin as an assistant professor somewhere. And so there's a poster for it. By the way, if you have one of those fancy cameras, you can take a picture of that and then uh, that little decal in the lower right hand corner that will take you right to the thing, but too late, you didn't take a picture, so. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the, the last five minutes, I wanna talk about um, some ideas about how Exceed can really play the role of the integrator for all of these kinds of activities. I think it's a really great starting point for this. So to me, this is my messy picture of what Exceed is trying to do. Now, 
In order to get prepared for this, I asked um, all the division directors within MPS, that's mathematics, physics, chemistry, uh, astronomy, and materials, to go to their program officers and say, what would they like Exceed to look like? What kinds of services? And so that's kind of a start. I wanted them all, first of all, to take notice of this, and secondly, to have them really start to think about it. And it's pretty interesting what came out of this. So I first want to point out that we're the biggest directorate in NSF at, at $1.4 billion. And we have some of our own programs that develop cyber infrastructure and so on. So if you all, as developers or as scientists funded by that directorate, go talk to your program officer and say, I would really like to be able to integrate my activities with those of Exceed or as it's being developed, you might get some buy-in. So there are additional funds that could be possibly made available. Of course, I, I'm not promising anybody anything here, but I'm just saying there's a conversation. I'm trying to raise the level of the national discussion about what really needs to have happen here. So the general remark is everybody who's talking about data, about heterogeneous computing services, and everything that I've just been talking about, and I've more or less gone into some depth about what astronomy and physics have been talking about. So they came back with things like this. They want to see integration at the campus level. They want, uh, uh, particularly in physics, the open science grid is very important. They want that to be deeply integrated at the campus and the national level and so on. But chemistry and DMR um, had a couple of things that I, I, they sent me a couple pages, but I carried these out. So one, uh, I, I, I brought these out. First of all, infrastructure that encourages collaborations on an international scale seamlessly integrating data, software, and hardware resources. So chemists and material scientists are highly numerous and tend to work more in isolation than, say, the big teams in physics and astronomy and so on. But they'd like to be able to work collectively. So you have the ability in your architecture to begin to integrate these things. There was a lot of talk about dissemination of, no of novel chemistry and material software and data infrastructures. And in, in fact, um, if you're in working in these areas, you might have noticed that the president of the United States, President Obama, two weeks ago mentioned in a speech at Carnegie Mellon uh, something about the National Materials Genome Initiative. Uh, and that's something we've been working on a lot within NSF and with DOE and some other agencies. And the idea there is that we want to be able to integrate uh, in a very compute intensive world and data intensive world, simulations, experiments, provide uh, databases of materials properties that could be used and shared by all, uh, and then uh, integrate theory as well. So a highly integrated program, and this is what, uh, what our divisions are also telling me that they want to see. And they like this idea of campus bridging. So how do you connect campus resources to the national cyber infrastructure? So the most active in terms of writing back to me was actually the, the, the Division of Mathematical Sciences. So that might surprise some of you. Um, they're really, really interested in this. So actually, they love this because they see a lot of new mathematics and statistics, and particularly, I think, I, I think you'll see a growth of statistical sciences because of all the data intensive science. We'll need to have new techniques for this to find features and so on, new tests and, and so on. So the DMS division said they wanted to have sharing of data, accessible warehousing and retrievable, uh, uh, retrieval of usable data sets and so on. Um, they talked a lot about reproducibility and verification. Um, they talked a lot about central repositories for data of interest and combining that with publications. Uh, and so just so you know, the, the mathematicians are thinking quite deeply about this. And all of this information on software, in particular, mathematical software, not necessarily just for linear algebra for solving PDEs, but for things of interest in mathematics, too. And so um, I think they're feeling a little bit left out. When I talk to them, they always feel like they're not really supported. That is, the mathematics community, sort of as a service to the physicists, they know that they have a role to play, but they also have research that they'd like to carry out in a computer-intensive and data-intensive world, too. So, so anyway, I, I, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just say there are lots of ideas also in, in education that they were particularly interested in. In particular, how do you provide information about what's known already in, in computational mathematics or even in pure mathematics? How do I solve certain things and to be able to articulate that and try to get answers? So these are the kinds of things they came up with. So I'll provide the slides. I want to just go ahead and, and skip on to the next thing. So I just want to emphasize that this, this is not coming specifically from the broader community, but actually from the program directors within NSF. And so that means that they're very interested in these things, and therefore you might strike up partnerships with them as, if you were to go have conversations with them. So, okay. So Exceed now has the beginnings of an architecture that's, I know it's been evolving for a long time, a lot of good ideas for over the last uh, decade and more that have led to this, in fact, a couple of decades, even going back to metacomputing in the 90s and so on. But I think 
this is now the first time that you're actually putting all these services together in a way that can probably begin to accomplish these goals. And so I wanted to, to point out a few things here. You've got the layers, many of the things that were requested by the program directors and MPS show up in your slide, uh, but not in the same language necessarily. And also in the lower right hand corner you see open, I see other resources. That's where I'm talking about things like remote telescopes, the ocean observing initiative, uh, other things like that. Those can be integrated because that's part of the playground of the scientists these days. So the good news is that you have an architecture, but just note that the language differences are pretty severe. So the mathematicians won't resonate with those languages, right, <laughs> that you put in there, those acronyms but they want the same thing. And Exceed can't do all this alone. So there are resources that could be coming from other parts, other agencies that we need to think about how to coherently aggregate them to do the kind of work we want. So last two slides here, the opportunity. I, I think we have many of the critical elements in place and the Exceed architecture can connect many things from the campus to the national cyber infrastructure along the line of campus bridging. We have all of these campus assets. MRI sometimes provides a small supercomputer or an instrument that should be shared. You might have noticed if you look at the MRI, that's a solicitation for uh, major research instrumentation at NSF for up to $4 million. There's a new sentence in there that does talk about facilities that support the vision for CIF 21 are particularly encouraged that allow collaborative development. Also, if you could connect that to, for example, curriculum development in collaborative computational and data intensive sciences, those are, are highly valued uh, by us. So finding ways to integrate these things and then connecting facilities to campuses. Don't forget about the, the telescopes, the accelerators, the light sources and so on. And then things like observing systems that are just going into place. Some of these are in the early planning phases. NEON, OOI, LSST, um, some of them are being built out, some of them are still at the conceptual and preliminary design review, but there are ways to integrate these. So here's my, my final pitch to you, which is um, uh, exhortation. So first of all, I think CIF 21, the Emory of Sea Line and disciplinary programs can be aligned and, and people are interested in knowing how best to align them to support this vision and XSEED seems to me to be the natural centerpiece for this. It has, um, uh, we have a lot of needs and data and applications and instruments and so on. There are funds to, still to be developed, still to be aligned. So I, I would urge a kind of a national discussion on how we would go forward with this. And in particular, I would urge you to talk to your program directors. If you're scientists who are using uh, TerraGrid or Exceed resources planning to, go talk to your chemistry program director or your uh, biology program director and so on. They need to hear about what you're doing and how it fits in with this overall picture. So my suggestion is to organize some discussions thinking about these different programs to try to address the question, how do we build what's needed, basically? And it's, it's, it's not all up to you alone, but I think you can help catalyze the alignment of other activities as well. So I think I won't go and repeat this again. I'll just say, I, I know I've run late and I, and I even came late, so thanks a lot for listening. Uh, there's a lot of activity going on. It's, it's, it's great to see that this program is, as of today, it's, it's ready to roll. And I hope it can play a, a, a central role in developing uh, the national cyber infrastructure that supports all of this science. Thanks. Hi, Ed. It looks like Mike, right? Mike Norman. <laughs> Brilliant talk, as Thanks. usual. Um, underlying the notion of worldwide integration is persistence. Persistence of infrastructure, collaborations, et cetera. And yet, when I look at the current TerraGrid Exceed program, what you have now is an integrating layer in Exceed, but you have very unpersistent resource now called service providers. So I think, fundamentally, these two things are at odds. So what would your suggestions be about how to fix that situation? Well, as you know, I've talked a lot about that too, and I, I agree totally with that. And so, I mean, the underlying cause for this is, of course, the fact that um, there's the, the culture of 
of Garand says that we want to have room for new ideas and we want to have uh, the, the best things uh, rising to the top and so on. And then at the same time, so that kind of goes against the idea that we would have persistence and sustainable uh, facilities and so on. Uh, and so you'll notice in the, the most recent round of the track two solicitation, there's at least the sentence in there, in fact, uh, the, the possibility that the, the facilities can be renewed. Uh, that's a step in this direction. Uh, and so there's a lot of discussion on how do we maintain kind of the cutting edge, uh, perhaps through stronger management at NSF, uh, as well as, uh, um, I mean, maintain, well, maintain the cutting edge with as much competition as possible while maintaining, while having stability. And so you could imagine longer term uh, funded actions that have a stronger management from the, the foundation and so on. So there are things like this. Of course, the, the science board is, is also in the mix and, and they are, um, frankly, always asking questions about uh, whether or not someone else could do something better, uh, whether or not um, uh, this facility is really needed, whether or not it's open and shareable. They're really focused on the data. So there's also a discussion going on with the science board. So I would just say make this, uh, this point heard as much as you, as you can. I think we're all understanding this point. It, it is really difficult for large-scale, long-time facilities like this, this kind of vision to be implemented without more sustainability. So I agree totally with you. Hi, Ed. Thanks for coming. I know it wasn't easy. Um, so you mentioned a few times about the, the need to, to share data, um, to archive it, to manage it, and, and really deal with the, the mass amount of data that's being created. And there's, you, you mentioned one product, and there's a lot of really good products out there to, to handle those kind of things. So I'm just wondering, what, do you, what kind of buy-in from the, the federal government is there going to be to, to push towards a long-term curation of this data? And then how do you... How do, you, how do you deal with all that when there's more data than there are people to review it? I mean, crowdsourcing works when you have a bunch of people, but you know, not so well if you don't. Right, so it's a really good question. Um, I mean, on the, the, the one, at the one um, first level, I would say, in terms of um, sustainability of the data sets and the ability to curate them, we need to have a persistent, coming back to Mike's point, a, a persistent uh, data infrastructure of some kind. And I would say that the, the conversation about data has gotten so at a, such a high level that, for example, OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy of the President, has been convening agencies to work together to come up with a sort of a, a stronger plan for, for dealing with a, a data infrastructure. With some, so there are some suggestions that are reaching a very high level of even the President's science advisor. So the attention is there. The implementation of this is still not very clear, and the funding is not very clear either. But it, it, one thing it is clear is that if data intensive science is the, the wave of the future and is even coming at us right now in the present, it's going to cost money and we're going to have to find a way to actually provide that. So at, at the same time as we recognized about 20, 30 years ago that uh, large-scale computing infrastructure in the form of supercomputers was needed, we're going to have a need to have a, 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 data, a persistent data infrastructure as well. In terms of the policy, we're also thinking a lot about that. And again, if you look carefully at the language coming out of the subcommittee that just made the markup for the um, uh, the funding for NSF, they very specifically put in language about uh, public access of data and publications funded by the National Science Foundation. And so this is the, at least the, the thinking is advancing. I'm, I'm not sure we quite know how to do this yet, but it's getting a lot of thought, and that, that I can say. Um, how do you foresee other branches of physics, such as AMO, which are not traditionally data and compute-driven research area can be transformed to meet this new era of scientific computing? Well, I should let Barry answer that. It's perhaps somewhere Barry, Barry, is, uh, Barry Schneider's here. But, um, but uh, I, I think it's, it's more in the realm of the kind of the area of the chemist. So I think they're very similar sort of culturally to the way that the people who work in atomic and molecular op optical uh, physics, AMO, uh, th that they're similar to that. So there are lots of people who work in these fields and they need to share things. And so ultimately they'll, they'll have experiments and uh, simulations also, but tend, they don't tend to have the sort of very large scale uh, activities in terms of the teams to do complicated astrophysics problems, but it's more at providing the infrastructure that allows people to share their knowledge and information, provide the, uh, the data that perhaps come with experiments, have that tagged directly to the publications, and to provide an infrastructure for that. So I, I will also say we are experimenting within um, NSF uh, or toying with the idea that we might create an experimental 
infrastructure that would allow the tagging of data publications and with certain conditions that the data need to be shared and so on. Uh, and so th this would allow many, many scientists to uh, provide information about their activities and then to put it in a shareable way. So that kind of gets to what you're talking about as well.